Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. I am so excited that the audience gets to hear this conversation. We bring back one more time an old friend. Not an old friend. He's not old, but he is a... He's a little old. He's older than us. We'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's been on the show numerous times. He might as well be a third co-host at this point. But this is a conversation that we really, really wanted to put together just around the holiday season. So I think we're still in that time frame. But I'm going on and on. I'm so excited. Uh, Tim, how are you? I'm excited to hear that. <laughs> I'm doing great. Yeah, this was a really fun conversation that we had with Mike Morford. Of course, Morph hosts the or really co-hosts the Criminology podcast. But he also does several others, including The Murder in My Family and Missing Persons. But Lance, this conversation with Morph, we get a bit lighter because we're not talking about true crime. We're actually talking about movies. And there are three movies that were made under the title Black Christmas. One of them, and the first one, was 1974, and that's definitely the best one. But we do talk about all of these movies a little bit in this conversation, and we really just break it down. Talk about what we like about it, what we didn't like about it, the differences between the movies, and if there were any true crime elements taken for the movies. We do talk about that a little bit too. Right. And this conversation really stems from all of these conversations that we've had with Morph after we have him on and we hit the record button. We talk about the true crime topics and we hit stop and then we start talking about movies or something of interest that is mutual between the three of us. And then we always say at the end, we really should do an episode about this. And this is it. Hopefully there'll be more of these that are you know, maybe specifically related to like the time of year or something going on in current events or something like that. But it's a really fresh conversation and a fresh perspective. Cool. So I hope you really enjoy it. Make sure to follow us on social media at Crawlspace Podcast or Crawlspace Pod and follow Morph on social media while you're at it. And Tim, one last thing, if people wanted to hear this, if they just needed more of Mike Morford without commercials, interrupting that experience, where could they go? Well, listeners can subscribe to Crawlspace Premium now on Apple Podcasts. Or if you're not an Apple user, you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the same product there. We're going to break real quick for one of those commercials, and we'll be right back with our conversation about Black Christmases with Mike Morford. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Welcome back to Crawl Space. Mike, true crime guy, Morph Morford. How are you today? I'm living the dream if I'm with talking to you guys twice in like one month. Like the highlight of my year. It all came in the in the last couple of weeks of the month of the year. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we love having you on, and we wanted to make sure that there was no question as to who held the title, who held the crown of appearances on Crawl Space. So that's why we wanted to get a few in at the end of the year, just so that title was uh, secured for you. But God, I can't tell you how exciting this conversation is going to be. I've been looking forward to it. Anytime I don't really have to prepare or think about too much stuff and do any kind of real homework, uh, you know, that's a, a bonus. <laughs> All right, well, don't tell on yourself, Morph, because there, there was a little bit of homework uh, needed for this. Today, we're going to be talking about the movie Black Christmas, the horror classic from 1974 that has actually spawned two remakes that I also want to talk about a little bit because they do go more in depth on the killer's backstory, which I find interesting. Overall, the original 1974 Black Christmas is by far the, the best version of these. No question. I'll do it right up there with Halloween. And Halloween's always been one of my favorites, but Black Christmas set the stage for the slasher flick. The whole movie, that's just the production, the cinematography, the music, the atmosphere. You know, I'm sure we're going to talk about some stuff that's going to be spoiler alerts, but there's a lot of a lot of creepy aspects that are in that movie that you don't get with movies nowadays. Nowadays, it's all jump scares or, you know, special effects. And back then it was just, let's just tell a creepy, scary story and build this atmosphere. I think you guys are John Carpenter fans as well. So, you know, that's sort of what his movies are, you know, setting that atmosphere and, and telling a, just a really good story. It seems to me like the 1974 Black Christmas must have inspired the 1978 Halloween because up until that point, there weren't really holiday horror movies. And again, as you mentioned, the slasher subgenre 
in itself was really in its infancy. And I feel like people don't consider the slasher genre a, a thing until Friday the 13th and then Halloween and then some of those movies that came after. Yeah, in all reality, this 1974 Black Christmas, I think, inspired a lot of these movies, including Halloween, but also When a Stranger Calls, which was released in 1979 because of the uh, the phone calls that the sorority sisters are uh, receiving. And then one of the twists being that the call is coming from inside the house. Yeah, it's a spoiler alert, but I mean, it's a 50-year-old movie. <laughs> but it's also like the entire premise of When a Stranger Calls. <laughs> When a stranger calls is so bad. It's it's a it's a bad movie. The babysitter part where she's getting the calls up until the cop shows up is pretty good. It's a great short film. But you could boil that movie down into 30 minutes and have it be good. The rest of the movie's just god awful. But yeah, it's a complete ripoff of Black Christmas. Well, you did say that there were gonna be some spoilers, Morph, and we have to say that this is Tim said it's a fifty year old movie, which is remarkable that this is half a century old, nineteen seventy four. So you will I think at some point, right, when you're talking about a movie, there's gotta be a cutoff. Like after twenty years you can give the spoilers to movies now. Hopefully if there's anybody listening that has not seen this movie you got to go out and watch this movie because it's if you're a horror fan it's it's just that good but sometimes people don't watch movies right away how long did we beg you to watch once upon a time in hollywood <laughs> we couldn't give any spoilers away because you wouldn't watch it and then you finally did oh uh, next next movie review episode that we do with you more if we can do that one because i did finally watch it and i did avoid watching it because of the comedy of you continually telling me to watch it and it was just funny at some point Yes, that is a really good movie. I'm glad I watched it. We were just talking about the inspiration that Black Christmas had for other horror movies, where you have the faceless stranger that is terrorizing a group of young women. Same thing in Halloween. But that concept of the final girl, right? The one character that remains aware and capable of bringing the bad guy down. Well, I know what you're going to say, Tim, with the character (laughs) of Jess. Like, she... She doesn't really take the bad guy down, but she's um, she's got good wherewithal, good presence throughout the movie, and had the good sense to work with the police in order to figure out what was going on. Because I can't think of another slasher movie before that that had a character like that. But she's also got that, the cop tells you to go out the house, don't ask any questions, just walk out and get out of there. And of course, she can't do that because that would be too easy. She's got to go look for trouble. Well, she was trying to save her friends, right? Yeah, she was trying to save her friends, but she also kind of implicates the wrong guy. And I'm pretty sure she kills the wrong guy. She kills the wrong guy. Yeah. At the end of the movie, which is cool that she defended herself. But again, she was wrong in that. Even after that is another twist. Maybe we'll say for a little later in the episode. That's the part that really sticks with you. I guess, is that a trope? The final girl in Slashers. So what What are the other ones? Like the, uh, the calls coming from inside the house. That's a good trope that it started. Right, right. And just phone calls in general, which yep. I think uh, Kevin Williamson, who wrote Scream, was heavily influenced by Black Christmas as well. Because as most people know, Scream starts with a phone call and it turns creepy. In all of the movies, all of the three Black Christmas movies, there are elements of phone calls sort of a stalker, obscene things that this caller are, is saying, especially in the 74 one. Really obscene. Very obscene and unnerving. And then Margot Kidder from, I believe, whoa, she's, she was Lois Lane famously, right? Correct. So Lois Lane is, is in it, and she starts talking back to the voice on the phone, and then it goes from obscene to, I'm going to kill you changes on a dime like he's doing all these demented creepy just psychopathic voices where you're saying okay this guy is not playing with full deck and then he just quietly transitions into this normal i'm gonna kill you just matter of factly very good and and the actor that did the voice work and that is a guy named nick mancuso and he did a fantastic job and it's just very disturbing these calls they are very vulgar but to me it's really what makes it creepy because back in the 70s there was no star 69 there was no caller id you had no choice but to deal with these calls or just hang up the phone or disconnect the phone and that's really what i think sets it apart from you know trying to do this movie today because now you've got so many tech things and social media and just digital trails and everything else that it just it doesn't have that same effect trying to make the same movie today to me and also it's the sound of the telephone that's really unnerving too if you put that sound in any environment it's so jarring that becomes the main character of that scene is this phone call that ring 
it's the ringer on my cell phone. <laughs> nice. I love I I love it. It's I think it's called old phone, and I have that on there because I just love the sound of that. I'm watching this the other night, just trying to brush up on it again because I hadn't seen it since last Christmas. And my son's like, "That sounds just like your phone." <laughs> <laughs> So the 2019 version, which is now the second remake, stars Imogen Poots, uh, who, who's pretty good in it. But the movie is PG-13, which is a, a real problem for horror fans, which essentially means there's no gore, no blood at all. And one of the weirdest things is that like, when someone gets stabbed once, they're just like lifeless immediately. <laughs> in the other movies, people struggle and because that's more realistic. One stab with an icicle to the chest, you don't breathe anymore. You don't take an other breath like that isn't re isn't even close to reality and it's really they're just trying to avoid the r rating which probably hurt it in the long run yeah maybe trying to draw on some of the younger viewers broaden the audience but but you're hurting the the crowd with the older people that are used to the rated r stuff and want you know the over the top stuff or just the realisticness of like even having a conversation in that situation right people would be swearing their heads off people would be very vulgar if they're experiencing all of this violence around them so it just takes a bit of the reality out of it the new version also has has a text message angle the killer or are stalking the sorority sisters via a text message and all three take place in a sorority house and the newest one is very socially conscious in it there is a fraternity storyline and one of the fraternity brothers uh, raped one of the sorority sisters so that's kind of the jumping off point for the movie we don't get the killer known as billy lens that is in part one and two parts one and two uh or i guess the original and the first remake billy lens is the killer in part three or the third it, he's not he's not a part of it at all there's no backstory about billy lens <laughs> now this is a spoiler here it's uh it's the fraternity brothers so there's more than one killer and the fraternity brothers are trying to kill the sorority sisters in this there's no creepy guy hiding in the walls of a house the worst part about it is there's a supernatural twist at the end of that of that movie which is like mind-blowing if you're coming from a place where this was influenced by this 1974 movie so they're sort of ripping off scream a little bit with the multiple killer angle too yeah but it's a supernatural thing where it's like the head of this university like he's influencing these new frat boys frat brothers to kill this was produced by jason blum blumhouse it's a blumhouse movie yeah wow that's surprising so I, I do think they were trying to go for a younger audience, definitely hit like a socially conscious point and came out at a, a in 2019 at a, at a time where everyone's socially conscious and, and trying to be more so. I kind of understand where they're coming from because this is a story about a man who kills sorority sisters. So that's kind of like you know, like an anti-woman idea in the first two, if you if you think about it from that POV. So it almost like tries to make good on what the first two did for the sexes. You know what I mean? You bring up a good point because I'm thinking of the very first one. There's some social issues in the other direction. The girl is pregnant. She wants an abortion. And he's like, well, how are you going to get an abortion? You didn't even ask me yet. <laughs> like he's has to give her permission. So that was like 180 degrees in the other direction. It's funny how things change over time with more modern thinking i do wonder you know if they're deviating so much from the original in the third one why even call it black christmas why don't you just make it its own standalone movie i just looked up the budget and what it grossed and the budget for that movie was five million dollars and it made 18.5 million at the box office so that was just a quick millions of dollars so they probably could have given it another name but i feel like it's a quietly successful franchise i don't know if 18 million is considered a, a box office smash by any stretch but if you're making three times what you spent on it without much effort then eh, i don't know i'm not in the movie i don't, don't know about movie making and production you guys know more about that stuff than me but to me it seems like if you're gonna make a, a movie make it the best you can you know whether it's successful or not put out a good product and not something you're going to look back later on and say, I can't believe I was part of this <laughs> fiasco. Yeah, I'm with you. Production wise, it, the newest one wasn't awful. It was almost like 
a little too heavy handed with how socially conscious it is. I get it. It's kind of trying to uh, right maybe the wrongs from the previous two versions. Ultimately, the end and the lack of an R rating is what hurt that movie. It's not the look. It's not the acting. It's not really even the story until the very end that really kind of ruins it. For me, we talked about this before we started recording. For me, the trailer just looked so bad to me that I was like, I'm not going to even bother to watch this. I was going to watch it just to have something to talk about. And I was like, I, I can't. I just can't do it. If you watch the trailer closely, it, it actually reveals the twist that we've already talked about in this in this episode. There's a shot of Imogen Poots saying, you guys are all crazy or something like that. And you can tell there's people around her. So it's like it really... It really gives it away in the trailer. But I don't know, maybe the audience that was intended to see the 2019 version, like never knew about the other versions and, or at least the 74 version, you know, hadn't seen that most likely because this newest version was for younger people, you would imagine. And I mean, they do that over and over again with so many movies that they just, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, what else have they remade? I mean, the Halloween things they've redone over and over again. I just, you know, I wish younger people would just, I know that the the quality of the imagery isn't as good as and the, and the special effects aren't great, but I wish they would go back and discover some of these old gems that are great movies just the way they are without the the high production and the modern technology uh, being part of it. Reminds me of what they did with the remake of Hellraiser. I didn't see that one because the original is so good. I don't even think I would watch a remake. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about it because they made Pinhead be portrayed as a female character. She did a fantastic job, but it's it's hard to switch gender for Pinhead for me. And in the original, there was a good female character that was a sidekick of Pinhead's. And I thought the three of them were good just the way they were. In the 2006 version of Black Christmas, there are actually two killers. There is Billy Lenz, who is the killer in the original. But in the 2006 version, his sister slash daughter is also a killer. Sister slash daughter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So this is a little bit of a spoiler, but it, it goes into this in the beginning of uh, the 2006 version. It, it gives Billy Lenz, the killer, a, a backstory that he never had in the 74 version. And what I find interesting is that Black Christmas came first and then Halloween. And Halloween seems to have been somewhat inspired by Black Christmas, the original. But then this 2006 version of Black Christmas was inspired by Halloween. By going into the backstory and keeping it like with the siblings. Exactly. So in Halloween, you know, Michael Myers, he kills his sister and then he's sent to an insane asylum. And in this 2006 version of Black Christmas, Billy Lenz is raped by his biological mother who had killed his dad, Billy's dad, buried him under the house. And Billy in this version has jaundice which gives oh. his uh, his skin a yellow tone. And that sort of seems to be his mom's motivation for hating him. And she kills his father, yeah, rapes Billy, and then becomes pregnant with Billy's kid. And Agnes is born, who is beloved by the mom. Billy just kind of loses it at one point because he was locked in the attic for essentially for years and can travel throughout the house inside the walls, which is such a creepy idea. Then he attacks on Christmas Eve. He attacks his family. His, he kills his stepfather and his mom. And then he tears out his sister's eye and eats it. And then when the police arrive, uh, he's, uh, Billy is actually eating holiday cookies made from his mother's flesh. And that had happened in, you know, sort of in the beginning of that movie, in the past, in, in this uh, second version, 2006 version. And then he's in an insane asylum and the security guards are telling you he's he tries to escape every Christmas and then he finally escapes. And then he makes his way back to this sorority house, which was not a sorority house when he lived there. It was a, a residence and it was only turned into a sorority house afterwards. And so him and his sister, Agnes, are both in the walls and are killing these sorority sisters in the 2006 version. See, to me, that's that's too much information. To me, less is more. In the original, his name is Billy. We don't know his last name. We assume his name is Billy. He's talking about Agnes. We don't really know who she is. You know, he keeps saying what your mother and I must know is. So you assume that Agnes could be his sister, but we don't know for sure. But we don't know what the backstory is. And that's, for me, I like that. I like the not knowing. And I like, you know, I don't like having a nice, tidied up bow on it ending to where it's like oh we we checked all the boxes we answered all the questions you know we can leave satisfied i like not knowing at the end who was this guy 
why was he doing it? It just leaves something to the imagination versus filling in all the blanks and, you know, giving you all the answers. And the voices that he's using when he prank calls the sorority sisters is a combination of him as Billy, but he's also responding as if he's having a conversation with Agnes, right? Yeah. And and also his parents, uh, well, we assume his parents, sometimes he's making like pig sounding noises. So he's really running the gamut on these crazy, creepy voices up until that one line that we mentioned where he just calmly says, I'm going to kill you. The only time he talks normal when he's on that phone is when he tells her that. When Nick Mancuso was auditioning for the role, Bob Clark, the director, had him turn his chair around and and not face him because he wanted to hear the voices. He didn't want to see the expressions. He wanted to hear what they would sound like. And he just kind of winged it at his uh, audition and nails it. When you watch it for the first time and you learn that this is just one person performing this and not a couple with some effects, it's even more impressive and, and kind of terrifying. Yeah, and at one point in the movie, one of the girls says to the other one, that can't be one person talking, is it? Because you hear this whole conversation going on, but it's one person doing it. Even the girl makes the comment, how's that one person doing all that? And Lance, the director of that original, he also directed A Christmas Story, is that correct? Yeah, Bob Clark is remarkable. He did Porky's, really good movie. If you haven't seen it, I haven't seen it in years, but it is a the really good movie. comedy. Yeah, raunchy comedy, you know, that really inspired like the American Pies and and those types of movies and A Christmas Story. So Black Christmas is like his antithesis to A Christmas Story. And I just learned this because I knew that Black Christmas was partially funded by the Canadian Film Society, I think, and was shot in Canada as essentially a Canadian movie. And he was living in Canada to avoid paying American taxes. And this was part of or started the Canucksploitation film industry where Americans would be making these like low budget movies in Canada and they get released in the United States and they would make a pretty decent living doing it. But yeah, that's Bob Clark, American guy who went to Canada <laughs> to capitalize on the Canucksploitation. Uh, for all the Canadian people out there, that's not my term. That's just what I read. I'm not trying to insult anyone who's from Canada. At the end of the day, on his resume, he's got two of the best Christmas movies ever made. Totally different from each other, but... <laughs> that is funny how opposite uh, of, of the spectrum those two movies are. Yeah. I actually got my sister to watch it and her partner. They watched it on the 26th after Christmas because we told them they needed to watch that movie because... He had said, my sister's partner, he had said, every Christmas we always do a Christmas story. And I was like, well, if you like a Christmas story, the same guy who did that did Black Christmas. So watch those back to back. And she texted me and she was like, this movie's incredible. Isn't it weird that there's a slasher movie about Christmas before there was a slasher movie about Halloween? Yes. Yeah. Seems very so weird strange. to me. And I watched a, a sort of a documentary and they were talking about naming it something different in the States. They were going to name it Silent Night, Violent Night or something like that. But they said that some of the test audiences weren't sure it even meant Christmas. They wanted people to know it was a Christmas theme. They were even reluctant to make the move in the first place because it would be so sacrilegious to ruin Christmas with a, a slasher flick about it. So they actually were kind of hesitant to make a movie about this killer on Christmas to begin with it might have been silent night evil night there was a title a silent night deadly night i believe that that was a movie that got made i did see two of these movies in the movie theater the original black christmas at the new beverly cinema in uh, los angeles which is uh, the theater owned by quentin tarantino i saw it as uh, part of a double feature back uh, gosh gotta be 15 years ago now i think it was paired with the japanese horror movie called house i don't know if you guys know that movie from 1977 it's crazy yeah, a movie called House, but it was an 80s version. Oh, okay, that's the American version. The Japanese okay. version is insane. And then I saw the 2006 Black Christmas upon its initial uh, theatrical release uh, at the Grauman 6 in Hollywood. Uh, and then I watched the 29 version last night to understand what it was doing in comparison to these other two. That's cool. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you how old I am. I watched the original at the drive-in movie theater with my parents who used to take me to see inappropriate horror movies, and I loved it. 
as a wow. kid. Wow. I can still remember the sign, $5 a car load, as many people as you could fit in your car to go to a drive-in movie theater. And then you'd put the, the speaker on your uh, window and uh, take in the whole experience. And it's just the best way to watch a movie. I, I miss those days. Black Christmas is probably like right up there as a perfect drive-in movie. Oh, yeah. If I could watch it at a drive-in again, I, I would definitely do that. Was that in the 80s or was that? So the movie came out in 74. Now, I clearly remember it so it had to be i had to be a little bit older i was probably i'm guessing eight or nine so what they would do is they would put three movies together and I, that's how good the deals were it was five dollars a car load for three horror movies our whole family would go grab a thing of snacks blankets everything else and you'd make a home night out of it they would lump a new release out with two other horror movies so that's how I saw it. And I, I'm, I'm guessing I, I had to be eight, nine years old. So it had to be around 1980 or so uh, that I saw it. I just remember loving it even back then as a kid. It was creepy as hell and it wasn't appropriate to be watching. But, you know, my parents were pretty cool. Luckily, they let me uh, partake in it. If it's ever playing at a drive-in anywhere in the country and we figure this out, we all have to take a road trip and see it. It, it might be worth doing. I, I, I really believe that. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. I wanted to bring up the cast of Black Christmas 1974. Uh, Tim had said something before we started recording earlier today, and he, he was not a fan of Margot Kidder's performance in this, which totally understand. But Olivia Hussey, as the main character Jess, really nails it. What are your, what are your thoughts on her performance? Famously, Juliet, right? In, in one of the uh, first uh, Romeo and Juliet movies. I, th I felt like she was excellent in the movie. Margot Kidder... It's just, it's just a weird performance to me. Olivia Hussey also has a little bit of an accent. I guess it's some kind of like French Canadian accent, I take it. And Margot Kidder sounds like, you know, she has no accent whatsoever. I thought Olivia Hussey was, was pretty good. When she answered the phone, she sounded kind of immediately like before she knew anything was wrong, she was sounded panicked when she was answering the phone. But then again, they mentioned that he had called before. So maybe she was just nervous about answering the phone in general. Who I really think it's overlooked in it is Peter. The guy that plays Peter, um, Kira Dulay. Just looking at him, he's so hateable. He's so <laughs> cringe for the time, but he's very intense and very creepy. It's weird because he had been in 2001 A Space Odyssey like five years before, and he was completely different, almost unrecognizable as the same person um, because he was an astronaut and he was like clean cut. You almost don't recognize him, but he was just creepy. And all, all through that movie, people that haven't seen it, they're trying to point the finger at this guy and say, this is the guy, this is the killer focus on him. He's doing all this weird and bizarre shit. And he's throwing these, these tantrums and stuff. And, and we, we find out at the end of the movie, he, he's probably not the guy. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when he's bombing his piano audition and he's just pouring with sweat and he knows when he's hitting the wrong keys and you can hear it and then it cuts yeah. to the people who are judging him and they're just so like not impressed with him and he's just just drowning and he's sweating so much in that scene and that brings about the piano because i think that's some of the best creepy atmospheric weird sounds from the piano that they put throughout this movie just really sets it off to me i liked john saxon's performance Great as a cop. Always great as a cop. Really is. Yeah. So he was in A Nightmare on Elm Street as well. Yep. Also played a cop, I believe, right? Yeah. It was Nancy's father who was a cop. Yeah. Right. Right. He's not just any cop. He's like the boss. He's like the, the chief. He did a lot of movies, but he was fresh off of what was that Bruce Lee movie he was in? Enter the Dragon, right? Yeah. He was just in that right before this movie came out, I think. So random because I didn't see Enter the Dragon until after I saw him in Nightmare on Elm Street. And then I'm like, this dude can do karate? I had no idea. It was such a shock to my young mind. I liked his line at the end of the movie when he says, I knew it in my gut it was that kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's wrong. <laughs> and it's like at the very end of the movie. But all three of these movies sort of have this element of one of the sorority sisters is missing. And the rest of them are listening to these phone calls. They're not sure if it's connected. They don't know why their friend is missing or where she is. But they try to go to the cops, tell them their friend is missing in all of them. The police are like, well, you know, she's probably shacked up with uh, with her boyfriend or whatever, which is like totally realistic to what happens when, you know, when someone's loved one is missing and they go to the police. That's typically 
one of the first things that is said, well, are you sure they're not with a boyfriend? Are you sure, you know, they might've run away or something like that? That's always the story we hear first. And so that kind of rang true to me. But also I thought it was interesting that all of the sisters would like, they got around in a group to listen to the, the phone call. Why are they listening and why don't they just hang up? Why are they entertaining this? To me, that's one of the best parts of the movie because they're just so, I don't want to say awestruck, but they're like, it, it's almost like a car accident. You drive by and you can't help but look. It's like they're all pinned to what this guy's going to say. Even though they're creeped out by it, they can't not be there to listen to it. I think it just builds the whole tension in the movie. And it also establishes that this has been going on prior. It's been going on in the past. And it's like, let's gather around and hear, hear what he's going to say this time. It makes this moment into this event that like literally takes them away from their Christmas party. It sucks all the life out of their Christmas party. We talked a little bit about technology and how it's changed. One interesting thing is we've always heard, you got to keep them on the line so we can trace this call, but you never really know what went into it. Then you see how they actually trace a phone call. It, it seems like a lot of work <laughs> that this guy was trying to do to trace this call. And you get to see behind the scenes what it's like to trace a phone call. And this guy is like in this warehouse with these floor to ceiling transmitters or something. And he's like, running around and plugging things in and running down another aisle and it's like you got to keep them on the line and it's a good observation more to be like see that's why you needed 30 seconds this poor guy is like running all over the place in this warehouse plugging in cables of course it's going to take some time crazy yeah you first see him like unscrew the telephone and uh, and tap it he puts right, like a right. physical tap on the phone and that's when john saxon the detective tells them you got to keep him on the line so that that makes sense then that they're trying to keep him talking or hope you know answering the phone and everything i did like all that that was fun to me it just goes back to why it's so much scarier back then for something like this to happen because you were at the will of you either would hang up disconnect your phone not answer it or have to listen to this stuff and there was no way to find out who's doing this unless you could somehow get the police involved and get them to trace the call. Right. Which is, you know, a challenging thing on uh, Christmas Eve when it's like not even a guarantee that there's anything really serious happening at all. So I kind of liked all that. What I also liked we didn't really talk about was there's another little girl that's murdered and it's sort of mingled in to the backstory of this. And you're like, well, I wonder if this is part of it is it connected because it could be i mean this is a small town and they also mentioned there was a girl that was raped not long before that so you've got two stories sort of unfolding and you've got two parents looking for their lost kids you know one of them's dead up in the attic but the other one is found out uh, in this park I, I like how they don't tie that up either because you you never find out are these things connected deliberately ambiguous there especially with the end you're right more if not a lot of people talk about that subplot of that other little girl. And I just watched this movie like three days ago and it had kind of left my memory too until you mentioned it. This is something that was tied into the antagonist's behavior before he get into the house. Yeah, they keep saying that the sisters will, will say, uh, oh, well, there was, a, there was someone murdered in the park and we're getting these calls and now our friend is missing. So maybe it's all related. So that's sort of part of why the police investigate their uh, sorority house. And when they find the little girl's body, they don't show it, which, to, again, to me, less is more. I don't need to see a body on the ground to know what they saw, what they found. You know, you could see the expression on the people's faces. And to me, that's part of the whole less is more uh, in my eyes. One standout scene for me was the uh, Christmas carolers. Was it Margot Kidder's character who was getting killed upstairs and Jess is watching the Christmas carolers? And she just has this great expression on her face of kind of relief like it's taking some of the stress off of her but there's this murder that's happening but being drowned out by the carolers as she's watching and it's just this kind of hypnotic scene they hold on her face for a while which i thought was really cool yeah that's a great part sort of a way to make this opening for him to strike and her not be aware of it you know they even cover their tracks and go back to where little things just little detail and this is where a, a good movie is made is the little details like in the shining all the little details that make sense all the way through the movie but here there's a scene where the house mother's trying to get in the front door and she can't be and it's jammed and she is we, we had to get the repairman out here to fix this door because it's always sticking and later on that's going to be a big thing but there's little instances where they hint about things earlier in the movie that come to play later on and i think that's a mark of a good movie is just little things that aren't all that important early on come back to be big things. I believe it's the first 
murder or one of the first when uh, when the killer is in the house and he's in the closet and he's like behind the plastic, I guess, like laundry bag. And you can kind of see his face, but you can't tell for sure if it's his face. And the sorority sister's like, is that you? And she starts and she squints and moves and, and moves closer towards it. And, uh, and then he attacks her. That that part is really a, a great, uh, a freaky murder for sure. No doubt. it's And it sort of sets the tone because it happens so early in the movie that you're creeped out the rest of the movie just remembering that one and then realizing, you know, there's more to come. And, you know, another, another one that stands up in my mind is when the house mother goes up into the attic and she looks over and sees the rocking chair with the, with the girl in it. And then before she can even react, she turns around and there's Billy with the big hook. It, it just really unfolds in, in a, a fantastic way. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. I was wondering, because I, I had forgotten, but when I rewatched this, I was wondering how Billy was simultaneously making these phone calls and being inside the house committing these murders and uh, i loved the i love when movies do this but uh, when uh there's like throwaway lines where it's like uh, the, the cops are like are there any other phones in the house and they're like no and they're like oh wait well the house mother has one but she never uses it and they're like oh okay and they haven't been getting any calls coming in so no no worries about that one right so don't think about it but but know that there is another one just in case and know that the door sticks <laughs> right oh my god that part i love that stuff when you come back and you look at it at the end you remember all those little things and you're like aha now it makes sense right i mean it's pretty conspicuous anyway but <laughs> so at the end we are led to believe that the killer did in fact kill jess she killed the wrong person by panicking and hitting her boyfriend with the the poker, right? The fire poker. Okay, so yeah. So the final girl kills her boyfriend because she thinks that's the murderer. Right. So do most of the people watching. Yeah, but y you kind of feel like it's not. Because it's too obvious they've been jamming him down your throat. Even to the point where when you see the killer's arm grabbing her hair, he's wearing essentially the same sweater as peter <laughs> good observation so, yeah that's a good yeah detail. so they're really jamming him down your throat and selling you on peter being the killer and super high strung and erratic and he beats the piano with the uh the stanchion i think which leads the cops to be like he's out of control i always knew it was that kid <laughs> i always knew it was that kid in my gut <laughs> yeah so this is this is the ultimate spoiler at uh, at the end of 1974's black christmas olivia hussey's character jess she's left in her bedroom to sleep to rest uh, her parents are coming in a couple hours. The cops are there. They're talking about how they wrap this mystery up and they're going to leave and let her get some rest and wait for her parents to come. <laughs> but they have no idea that the killer is still inside the walls of the house. And they never bothered to check the attic because there's two bodies up there that they still they One still of them is found. visible from the street. It's in the window. Yeah. Oh, that's bad police work. And the phone does ring at the end, right? It does. And it gets louder and louder as the credits roll. And they pan out away from the house and they keep panning out. And there's you can see everybody leaves the house, basically. But there is a one police officer standing on the porch. Not that that would keep her from getting killed, but there is somebody there. It's not like she's totally left alone. You know, it just it leaves open again that does he come down and kill her? Does he keep hiding out in the attic? We know that the phone rings and we have to assume it's him. So in the 2006 remake, it was produced by Dimension Films and the Weinsteins. And Dimension Films executive and convicted rapist Harvey Weinstein actually intervened and apparently demanded that a new ending be filmed. The first ending was apparently released in, I think, the UK. It was more of an homage to the original movie's ending, where it was kind of a little bit open-ended. Instead, what Weinstein sort of forced them to shoot, and, and it did make the end of the American uh, release, was that Billy actually tracks this final girl to the hospital. And so there's like another fight at the hospital and I think Billy gets thrown out the window or, or something like that. But it's it, it doesn't have that downer of an ending and, and it's not ambiguous either. Going back full circle with that, the movie execs wanted the original to have a different ending. They wanted at the very end for Claire's boyfriend the hockey player? The one with a great fur coat. Yeah, the, the awesome <laughs> fur coat. They wanted him to be standing over her and say, Agnes, it's me, Billy. They wanted him to 
be the killer. The director's like, absolutely not. No way. Absolutely not. I'm not doing that. He fought them and they didn't make him do it, which is good because if you look back during the movie, there's parts where he's like at the door leaving as the calls are coming in. So he couldn't be making the phone calls if he's standing there and with them. So there's little parts that wouldn't add up if they tried to jam him down your throat suddenly as the killer. And I'm, I'm glad they didn't try and do that. Yeah, me too, because his character was really good for what he was. Fur coat aside, he was the boyfriend of the first murder victim who they still hadn't found. And he was like the one who was aggressively, you know, going into the police station with the other students, with the other sorority sisters and demanding action be taken. So and he was a jock like he was playing a uh, hockey. So Canadian to have a hockey scene. <laughs> And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't really fit with him suddenly standing over her and reveal that he's the real killer. Although what's interesting is when you see these little silhouettes of Billy, all you see is a shadow of him, silhouette in the darkness, his eye in a couple of scenes. His hair looks a little bit like Claire's boyfriend's, but it also looks like Peter's or combo the two. So they leave what Billy actually looks like just ambiguous enough that you can't really tell what he looks like. But either of those guys, the main guys in the movie, could be him. But at the end of the day, you know, we really don't know. And there is a little bit of true crime that was mixed in in Billy Lenz's backstory. Apparently, director of the 2006 version, Glenn Morgan, was inspired by real-life serial killer Ed Kemper when he came up with the backstory for Billy Lenz. Oh, that makes sense. Yep, the mom stuff. Yeah, yeah, the mom stuff, exactly. I do still feel like it was influenced pretty heavily by Halloween. You can see where the real life crimes could have inspired it a little bit as well. For me personally, when I go to see a horror movie, I want to sort of separate real life crime from fake horror movies. You know, one, there's real victims, one, you know, is make believe. And I like to separate them. But I, I mean, I get where people like to use the inspired by what was the movie that um, oh, I can't think of the name off, off the top of my head, but the movie where the um, the people come to the house and there's a couple there. The, and strangers. They just no re- the strangers inspired by a true story. Is, is the tagline in the movie. And the true story was that there was a group of weird people going around in this director's neighborhood when he was a kid and people were just reporting to the police because they saw these weird people. They weren't killing anybody. Technically, it's inspired by a true story because it stuck with them. Or Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they say inspired by a true story, but nothing like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre happened. It was inspired by Ed Gein. You know, they use that term loosely of inspired by a true story. I personally like to separate my my horror movie fiction from from real life crime. Yeah, I definitely didn't make the Ed Kemper connection until I researched it afterwards. I thought it was more of uh, kind of what the Rob Zombie movie did for Halloween, where it went into Michael Myers' backstory a bit or a, a lot in the Rob Zombie version. Can we agree? I, I don't know how you guys feel, but I know how, how I'm, I'm pretty solid on this. Is there ever a case where a movie is made better than the original horror? movie gonna have to think about that one i don't know if i'm gonna be able to pull an answer right now yeah i can't pull an answer right now i would say that the the remake of texas chainsaw was a good movie but it doesn't touch the original but Mm -hmm. if the original didn't exist and you saw that movie you'd be like this is a good horror movie yeah yeah a lot of people liked it at the time it goes back to why don't you just make an all new movie i mean well, the chainsaw, the chainsaw is such a distinctive uh, weapon. You kind of got, if you're going to use that as a weapon, you got to make it a, a p- part of that, it seems like at this point. I feel like the remake of Friday the 13th was pretty good. I'm not a big Friday the 13th original fan. I like the nostalgia of it, but ultimately it's all point of view because Jason isn't even a character in the original. Mrs. Vore, his mom is the killer. But you don't even find out until the end, which is a little bit of a twist. Sorry for the spoiler again. It's almost like 45 years old. (laughs) Yeah, that one's Uh, past the threshold. But yeah, I don't know. I felt like, so Jason is in the first uh, or in the remake throughout the whole thing. And uh, I don't know. I just feel like that's uh, that's a scarier character than, than seeing it POV. Because you don't know who the killer is, and you know Jason is such a an imposing figure in that movie that uh, he seems unkillable. So I don't know that that one's the first one that comes to mind that I think is is somewhat close, but might have something to do with my personal bias of the original Friday and the, and like the POV uh, kills. And you bring up an interesting thing with the POV because in the original Black Christmas, you see things from the killer's eyes, and there weren't a lot of movies where they did that. You know, that sort of was new still from him walking up to the house. Interesting. You know, I know the creators of uh, Halloween, you know, in Michael Myers house where they walk up to that house and you see his view. It's almost shot for shot 
Black Christmas because John Carpenter liked that so much of the killer's view walking up to the house that they put that in Halloween the same way, seeing it from the killer's eyes. And then you see him actually climb up the, the trellis on the side of the house to get into the attic. And you get that point of view, even seeing his hands. Interesting to see it from the killer's eyes and not entirely from the... And that leaves open if they showed from the victim's eyes you right away know who the person is it's like a big spoiler it doesn't really add to any tension you'd need to give the uh, killer a mask which then it becomes a whole new character if this person's wearing a mask you know it's a whole new character development piece that goes into your main killer so keeping it pov super effective it was effective in Jaws, it was effective in Halloween, and it was effective in Black Christmas. As long as you're not showing, uh, how old was Michael Myers when he killed his sister? Six or eight? Yeah, pretty young, yeah. Yeah, so your POV shouldn't be that of like an adult. Like when he's going down the stairs and you're like, that's not as tall as he is. The POV should really only be used if it's a mystery who the killer is, in in my opinion. Yeah. Um, because I think it's scarier seeing the person from a, from a distance or climbing up the roof or whatever, you know, if you, well, what the hell is that? It's sort of groundbreaking too. Cause like, you know, in black Christmas, it was like the original GoPro. He actually put some kind of homemade attachment on himself to carry the camera. So the cameraman's actually climbing up this trellis and going into the attic, this camera's attached to him. And it was sort of groundbreaking because they didn't really do that stuff back then. Really gives you the feel that you're seeing things from, from the killer's perspective. It's really, really neat oh that's interesting yeah i didn't know is that why it has that like what is it called the anamorphic style yeah 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 so it can capture everything because it's going to be so close to that like the trellis and everything interesting it's all those little things that go together to me to make a great movie when you add all these little ingredients and that's what makes a a, a fantastic movie what's the next one we're going to be reviewing i don't know you guys invite me back i'm i'm always uh game the shining we could probably talk about The Shining for, for hours. I mean, we managed to talk about Black Christmas for an hour here, so I'm yeah. pretty sure The Shining would be a multiple-part series. <laughs> I uh, I missed, in watching the original um, Black Christmas or rewatching it, I missed the look of film because mm-hmm. it's just, you know, you kind of see that grain moving on the screen, and it's just beautiful. I don't know. Something about that gets me uh, nostalgic. Digital f- movies, you know, f- films made on digital uh, don't really have that same effect. And, and to me, the, it goes back to the less is more thing. I don't need shiny 3D digital premium video. You know, I don't need special effects. I just need a good atmosphere and a good story and good characters and And the rest just falls into place. You know, if you've got a good product, you don't have to hide behind, you know, all these different jump scares and all these different uh, technical special effects. All right, Morph. Well, this has been a uh, a really fun conversation. Let's definitely uh, let's definitely do this again. We'll figure out another uh, movie or or something to uh, to talk about. I'm game. Anytime you guys want to do it, I'm happy to come back. This completely satisfied that itch that I had to discuss this movie. This is more than satisfied my desire to talk about this movie. So thank you very much. 